Hi everyone. Today we'll finish uh, the chapter three. So this is the module five, and we will introduce some new concepts for the categorical variables, which are the will introduce the pie chart, the bar chart, the contingent tables, and also some more concepts in the actual regression, like lurking variables. So let's start. Uh, so most of the times prediction made using regression equation can only be trusted for uh, values of uh, x, which is the explanatory variable within the observed range of our data. Uh, so explanatory extrapolation is a type of estimation or prediction beyond the original observation range of the value of a variable on the base of its relationship with other variables. Uh, so predicting outside this range is called extrapolation. And by doing this, you might get ridiculous predictions. But let's see an example. It's like an example is predicting the death rate in New York for the year 2020, which is, this is like, if you're, is the previous example, which was like, we had that data till the end of 1970. So that's why it's 2020. So you can make it based on that example. This is like a ridiculous prediction because we had data up to 1970. So let's start with outliers. The classic outliers in regression are those, the points that are away, way away from the trend, which is the regression line of the other observations. Uh, influential outliers are only the points that have an x value or ex explanatory variable value far away from the rest and that fall far from the regression line or the trend than the rest of the data follow. Uh, so these points tend to pull the regression line towards them and and deleting these inflation outliers, removing them from the from our well, from our scatter plots, uh, can have huge impact on the regression line. Sometimes it can even change the sign of the slope, which means that a regression line which was previously positive has positive direction by removing an inflation outlier can become a negative uh, direction, can change to a negative direction. So we'll start with this example. So in this example, we can see a plot, which is a scatter plot, and it has the college GPA on the X axis, or it's the explanatory variable, and the age, which is our uh, response variable on the y-axis of several students. These are the students' dots. Uh, we want to sketch what we expect the least squares regression equation for this data bit that it will be. So we want to like draw a line. And then do the same thing after removing a specific uh, dot point, which is the dot point corresponds, which corresponds to the 28-year-old student, where is 28 is over here, so it's probably this. After that, so and then we will comment the difference between the two lines. So first, like we figure out that this 28-year-old person student. Uh, it, he might be like a potential outlier, right? Because it, it's like far away. So 
this is a potential outlier the person who is 28 years old is much older than the rest as you can see and his uh, observation does not follow the same trend as the rest is an inflation outlier but we don't know that yet but we assume that right so let's think how the line will be it will be like so since this there exists here we know that the line has to be something like this right so it will be positive very weak positive so right direction would be positive strength weak and linear okay. let's draw that so this is the regression line if we keep the potential influential outlier in the in our observations and as you can see it has a regression equation line it has like positive slope also it's uh, its strength is weak and now uh, let's remove the potential uh, influential outlier from our data and if we draw a line this time since there is there not doesn't exist any like any like uh, this point this data point we'll try to like be as close to our uh, rest the only like data data points that uh, with our sample has right so we want to be to have the minimum distance from our data point which in other words we want the minimum residual right so as you can see this time it has a negative slope and and the age the older student this time uh, students get a lower gpa right as the x increases uh, the gpa decreases while previously it was the other way around right and let's continue and here is like the previous the outlier in data without with inflation outlier in data as you can see it was positive and now when we removed it this is the green right so as you can see they are like their direction is opposite without the influential outlier is negative direction which is negative slope on the other hand with the outlier contained in our data is positive right with a positive slope so usually in this kind of cases we do not trust either regression line because they are way different and we should collect more data to find out the actual relationship between the explanatory variable x and the response variable y and now uh, what to what are we, what should we do to resolve this problem with the inflation outlier first the solution can be to check the data and correct the typos and if there are still unusual observation we can try to find out more about them and if whether there is an error and they don't belong uh, on uh, in the current data set and what's the reason that makes them different and if they do belong in the data set, data set we should delete the point before proceeding with the regression analysis uh, if the point is valid we should conduct uh, the regression analysis with and without that point like we did right now right previously with a blue and the green line so if the results are similar you may use them uh, the like with the results but in our cases the blue and green line would they were like very different so we were in the second case if they are different which was our case you should collect more data to find out the true relationship between x and y
this was our case. So here we'll learn about correlation and how that correlation doesn't imply causation. So in many studies, uh, the goal of the study is to prove that changes in the explanatory variable uh, call, they cause change in the response variable because we want to predict the y, right? However, even strong association does not imply the causation, causation which means that it's the reason that uh, y will change the x sometimes uh, when the x varies, changes like increase or decreases doesn't like when at the same time y changes doesn't always imply that the reason that y changed or the response was because of the change of x and this is a specific a whole field of study a research study and it's very hard to prove causation since there are usually other lurking variables that can affect the relation between x and y so, so that there might be a third variable and the reason that while x increased the y chain uh, it might have been like the third variable which is usually called in this kind of scenarios learning lurking variable an example there will see some examples about this kind of scenario. So first example is that news it's about the newspaper report which says that uh, the calf drinkers have higher blood pressure levels than the regular or non coffee drinkers. And the question is is the calf bad for your health? So first our explanatory variable we have to think what's our expander variable, our x. So we want to know when something changes, how it affects our blood pressure. So our expander variable is probably when we change the coffee type, how it affects our uh, how the it will be the choice of type of coffee, the choice of the type of coffee people choose to drink, right? And we're going to want to like examine how predict how the blood pressure will change. So the explanatory variable X will be like the type of uh, coffee and the response variable the blood pressure. This means that the x variable will be like the type of coffee, decaf or with caffeine. So it, it will be like, uh, it had, will have like two categories. Thus, it will be a categorical variable x, right? On the other hand, the response variable will be the blood pressure, which is scale. And it takes values from, a sp in, from an interval. So it might have the decimals, right? So it is a quantitative variable. So our x variable is quant uh, categorical, while our response y is quantitative. We've never seen like something similar till now, right? And we have to think about the graphical summary. Uh, we no, we can't do scatter plot because they are not both quantitative. In this case. In this case, so we'll do side by side box plot where uh, it, one box plot, box plot will contain the group for, for the group of uh, decaf and it will measure the blood pressure scale. And the other one on the side it will be for the other group of category, uh, group of X, which which is the category of co uh, coffee with caffeine, right? So it, it will measure the the corresponding like blood pressures scales. 
and in this example some we can think like a guess and potential lurking variable is the blood pressure levels before uh, they choose to what kind of uh, what type of a coffee they will like drink so before like they choose which the egg their X category right so we don't have any information whether they already had high blood pressure or if the reason that they have blood pressure is indeed the choice of the X that's why this is a potential variable like potential lurking variable so the conclusion of the newspaper report which was that decaf drinkers have higher blood pressure levels than regular coffee or non-coffee drinkers um, it's, it's pro wrong because we can't prove uh, that decaf is bad for us because of the potential lurking variable and we don't have any measure before the experiment begin right start and maybe the decaf drinkers this means that they already may have uh, high blood pressure and their like, doctors advise them to switch from regular coffee and now we'll see another example a very high positive correlation is found between the size of the head of school age children and their reading skills are big headed kids uh, smarter so are this can be translated are big headed kids like they do better in reading uh, skills they have better reading skill so we want to see whether changing the size of the head will change it will be like we'll be able to predict the if the kid is smart or it has good, good reading skills right so our expand the variable will be like the head of the the size of the head of the kid kid the children while the response will be the the test of reading skills and which this means so they are both quantitative variable the size of the head we have to measure the size right it's just scale and the test the exam of reading scale is also like a uh, takes a lot from a specific interval so they are both quantitative variable we have done this kind of example so we know that uh, the graphical summary is scatter plot and the potential lurking variable as you can see here we do not have any information the what school aged children mean school age I mean we don't have specific uh, age like five years old or something it is it might vary right so child's age is a potential lurking variable because and we can say that that we can't prove that we can conclude that we can't prove that big-headed kids which is our uh, eggs are smarter or they read better uh, because school age children range from like very like young till like fifth graders right we should have more information like okay. So the example three in the section of lurking variables is about uh, smoking. So the study says, so we had thousands of studies over the years that they conclude that smokers have much higher uh, instance of lung, lung cancer than non-smokers. So does smoking cause cancer? this is a question 
So the explanatory variable will be like categorical variable since it's either smoking or non-smoking. So, and the response variable it will be the cancer. So it's uh, either yes or no. So they are both categorical variables. Yes, no, two categories. Yes, no, two categories. And the graphical summary this time, it's something that we will haven't yet done. We will introduce uh, today. We will either do bar chart or con contingency table. So we'll see these two soon. And this happens because they are both categorical variables. And we have to think like about the potential lurking variables. So smoking might not be the only uh, thing that m makes someone to have cancer, right? So the potential lurking variables might be the age, the genetics, the gender, the weight, the eating habits, the drinking, and whether they exercise. There are many like potential lurking variables. Also, this time the conclusion is different. It's since we have this first row uh, sentence, which says thousands of studies over the years, we can say that only after like thousands of studies all over the world taking all of these other lurking uh, variables into account since they took into account probably the lurking uh, variables and they found the consi they found consistently like that uh, instance of cancer is higher on for smokers and non-smokers we can accept that smoking causes cancer in this kind of scenarios since because of the thousands of studies. Now we'll see another example in this section of lurking variables. So the example says that teacher salaries vary dramatically from state to state. What is the relationship uh, to the student learning? data from uh, NS NCE statistics for the 2013 school year was used for the following analysis. So the, this plot, the scatter plot, represents regression of average SAT math score, which is on Y axis, the response variable, versus the average teacher salary for each state. So the average teacher salary is on the x-x and we want to describe the relationship between two variables, uh, these the two variables which is the teaching salary and uh, their score in the SAT. And we can see that the regression equation is like negative right and let's so we can see that this is weak weak because there are the distances of the data points are way far for most of the dot data points right which means they will have high residual which is residual is the observed value minus the predicted values and the predicted values are on top of the regression equation so we'll have high residual and we will have a weak uh, strength in our regression equation and it's negative because the slope is negative of this regression line right and the higher the x is the teacher salary is uh, is the lower the SAT scores right because as it increases also, it's like weak, uh, weakly associated with this name. They are weakly correlated. In the second question, we, we have 
a scatter plot again here which represents this regression average regression of average SAT math score which is on y-axis is a response variable over here versus the percentage of students who took the test for each state this is on x-axis so we want to describe the relation between the two variables and we can see again it's negative this is negative uh, the direction is like negative and this again uh, it's this time it's the also this time they are closer the residual layers are smaller right they're not like scattered so so we can say that since they are not scattered they're close to the, our equation line we can say that the strength of the regression line is fairly strong and we, it's clear that we have negative linear correlation because the slope is negative and the states where most students take the SAT uh, have lower like uh, average SAT scores so it means that the higher the percentage the lower of the people to take the SAT the lower the scoring uh, the average score in SAT so, and finally like the last plot that we have is this one where uh, on, y, uh, on y axis we have again the average SAT math score and on the x axis we have the average teacher salary which is the f like in the first question with a blue line uh, for each state but this time the states have been split up into the, uh, the states where the percentage of students who took the SAT they were it was low so uh, not too many students took the SAT medium and high so the red line here the dashed red regression line corresponds to the states where the percentage of students who took the SAT test which was low on the other hand the black one is the regression line where the the states uh, uh, where at which the percentage of students who took the SAT test it, it was high like many students took in these states uh, that SAT score and lastly is the green line which is the average like the green regression lines represents the states where the percentage of students taking the SAT test it was like medium which is more like the average like the one that we had right in the general case without introducing this new variable which is the percentage by state so for states where a low the red or a high percentage which is the black of students take the test average we can see it's there we have positive slope this time so for low and high percentage of students when they take the test this uh, the state in this states the average SAT score is positively correlated with the teacher salary because they have this black line and the red line they both have positive slope right and the direction of these two lines the red and the black is positive so as the teaching salary increases the, their SAT score increases for this for this, these states with a low and high percentage of students but on the other hand for the green which is the medium like case the average for states with a medium percentage of students uh, taking the test the average scores uh, 
again it's very weakly like negatively because the direction is negative and the slope correlates with teacher salary so this time as x increases the SAT decreases and so let's like do a summary of this example so first we had this plot which was teaching salary and the SAT score so we didn't have like a category for each we didn't have the variable of low high or medium like percentage of students taking the test right it is the question the line exactly the same line regression line in question a and we didn't consider the variable of low which contained which specified the low if whether the percentage of students students were low mid or high of the of the corresponding of the states and we can see there is a, a negative uh, slope and the direction is negative and weak as the green line right which was the medium and when so when we added the extra variable we can see like the only uh, only the green line remained like similar to the average case the other two the high or low change direction now they are like they have positive direction positive slope so this is called like simpson's uh, paradox and in this example the states with low and high percentage uh, of students taking the sat the relationship between average sat scores and teacher was uh, reversed right because the direction of the red and gray uh, black changed so when we added the new variable the the relationship uh, changed it was reversed right when we include the third lurking variable so this is called the variable that we added was the it was a lurking variable because it, it changes so this is called like simpson paradox so the theory, theory like theoretically the simpson sounds paradox is the relationship between y or the response variable and x which is the expanded variable it, uh, it's when it changed changes when we add a third variable like we did uh, in our cases the, this is, they were like the average sat teacher salary and percentage so this is the the theory like the definition of simpsons so when we add a new variable the regression like line changes the direction and this is uh, you will have to know both direction right for the quiz especially for the upcoming so you can start from here and they can ask you uh, the other way around right and now we'll start uh, we'll like uh, focus on categorical variables and we'll introduce the graph set graphs that we use the graphical representation of categorical variables which are pie chart and part chart when we want to display categorical variables so previously in the further in the third lesson i think we introduced the graphs for we want to like represent quantitative which was the histogram the dot plot step and leaf plot while box plot as we saw we can use it in both so let's start um, in order to make the pie chart and bar chart we first make the this table 
this is called frequency table we don't have to memorize it um, so this table this table contains the counts and here we, uh, which is like or frequency which is how often each category occurs of this example in this example we have the years in school each category of this like occurs for each of the sample size and in this example we will take the data from the past STA year STA 23 class and we will like count how many of them of the students were freshmen and some foreign junior and senior so we'll count how many of the total students uh, uh, were in each of these like categories and then so we so we had out of the 144 students passed the last year at st 23 7 were senior 24 were junior 44 some foreign 69 freshmen the next step is to like calculate their proportion so proportion in other words is like how many the proportion for freshmen is 69 divided by the total right so 69 divided by 144 the same so for 44 divided by 144 24 divided by 144 7 uh, with 144 and so the proportion which is uh, calculated for example this one by dividing 69 which is the count for students who were like freshmen divided by the total 144 and this is the calculation that's equal 69 divided by 144 is this proportion of the freshman and we can find the percentage by multiplying this by 100 so these are the uh, percentages so first we will make the bar chart to make the bar chart we only need uh, the first two columns which is the group name the category names which is the freshman which is freshman song for junior and senior this names on the other column is that we need is the count column which correspond uh, in, in each like uh, year school year right so on, we need these two to make the bar chart and the count shows the it counts the occurrence of each category like how many they were like freshmen etc so these are bar chart as we can see all uh, four categories are spaced equally and the rectangles the four rectangles have the same width and the vertical scale which is the frequency or count starts from zero and the the increment is like in equal like reasonable steps right because the maximum is 69 and the map. that's why we use these increments and in in actual bar chart uh, you can have you don't have to put the usually they don't contain these like labels 69 44 24 and 7 it's you don't have to put this I just did to make it more clear for you so you can skip this uh, top numbers because we can clearly see it from the y-axis that this is 69 and this is 44 etc now uh, we'll make the pie chart to make the chart at pie chart we need uh, the f the first column which is the names 
but this time we want it uh, the second column that we will use is the percentage of the proportions so we use this and this so the first and the last uh, columns so this is how our, our pie chart will look like so I used the course color so you can like see it better and as I said for to make this we only use the first column which is the category of the year which is freshman so for junior senior and the last column the percentage of the so it's the proportion multiplied by 100 so the, so we use only these two measures to make this pie chart and if you want to use make it by hand you can like think so 47.91 percent is almost equal to 50 percent so we know that it will cover almost the half half of the uh, total like circle right and the same goes for the others but if you want to be like ex exact uh, about the measurements you can multiply the proportion which is 0. Uh, 47 by 360 which is uh, the d degrees of the total degrees of the circle so by multiplying 0 0.47 91 uh, if by 360 you can you will find the degree this degree and you can do this for each for example 0 0.30 uh, multiply 360 and etc but only if you want to be like exact like by now we'll as we remember in one of the example cases previously we had two categorical variables and we mentioned something called contingency table so now we'll introduce it so when both variables are categorical we use contingency table usually um, so like the contingency table displays the counts on the table and we calculate the proportion percentage for each group to determine the association that they have between them and if we divide uh, for each specific cell, uh, their corresponding count by the total number of observation in their group that they belong, uh, we'll find uh, the a percentage which is which is the conditional proportion. It's named like conditional proportion. And this like groups, it's since we have categorical variables, uh, these groups are like defined by the x excellent variable. So, but we will see an example now. So this is the first example in contingency tables. So the first example asks us a question. It asks whether the male college students. Uh, follow their school team more closely than females is the question and the following data over here was collected in class on Monday morning after a particular exciting and important basketball game and the question asked was did uh, did you watch the game on TV last night that was a question So our explanatory variable is going to be the whether they're male or female, whether being male or female, either male or female, it will like by changing changing the value whether we can like predict uh, whether they watch the game, right? So. The explanatory variable will be the gender, male or female, in this example, and the response it will be whether they watched 
watch the game and how much like they watch the whole game part of the game or none so we have two categorical variables this is the gender male or female here and the other categorical variable is the game how much they watch how long they watch all the whole game part or none and we want to find the conditional proportion of each gender uh, that watched all part and none of the game and this is a reminder what is the conditional proportion conditional proportion is the it is found found uh, by dividing each cell count by the total number of observations in their group and the group in the explanatory variable so in our case let's say we are here in the uh, in the this cell in the first cell top left corner over here let's so let's say we are here right so we are in the group of males right this all are this all are in the group of males so we are in group of males and in order to find uh, the percentage we have to divide the count uh, of this cell which is 10 by the total number of observation in the group of males so we have to divide 10 what is the total is 26 and if it was hidden we could still like calculate the total the total is 10 plus tw uh, 12 and plus 4 right so we divide 10 by uh, the sum of uh, the whole game the 10 12 and 4 which is 26 so I to make it even more like clear in the first cell we divide uh, the cell uh, the count by the correspond since we are in the group of males we we have to like we, we don't divide with the people the the people the students were like female because that doesn't make sense so we will divide the for this group uh, which, which is like we are the male group will divide the cell count of count by the total number of males in both all the like 10 plus 12 plus 4 and this is given so just the total number of males so 10 divided by 26 so this is the conditional proportion and as I said, in an, in, in an exercise, I can hide this part, right? Because it's, you can do, find the total number of males by adding sum, the sum, like adding 10 plus 12 plus 4, which is 26. So you don't need this last column. So this is the condition of push for males. And now we'll find so for females we do the same so for, for this cell we first think we have to ask ourselves the first question in which uh, group of the explanatory variable are we so the explanatory variable takes two like has two groups male or female so we answer to ourselves we are in the group of females so we only like we ignore the other like groups so we only focus on the females so in order to find the proportion condition proportion we need the cell count divided by the total number of people uh, observation in this group so total number of females is 21 plus 24 plus 30 which is 75 so we divide 21 by over with 75 and this is a condition proportion and this is like for the previous two calculation calculation together now let's 
I I only hide the sum of the table. So let's say we are in this second. Uh, in the second uh, cell and we ask ourselves again in, uh, in which group are we when for this count of 12 we, we so x x is equal to what so x is equal to male so we are in the group of males so we, we ignore the female uh, horizontal line over here so we in order to find the proportion for this proportion, we divide 12 by the sum of the males, which is 10, which is hidden, plus 12, plus 4, which is 26. So we divide 12 by over like 26. And with, for the females, for this cell, we are in the uh, group of females, and we do the same again, right? 20, we divide 24 by 21 plus 24 plus 30, which is the total uh, the people in the group of females, right? Again, exactly the same thing. And this is our final table. And these are, these are the condition proportion of each gender that watch all part or none of the game and if we add this condition proportion they, they are equal to one but, uh, for each group they are equal to one and this is a good way to check whether you've done any kind of mistake uh, by summing this plus this plus this is equal to one the same and the next question that we are asked is whether it's is it fair to say that uh, males were more likely to watch the game than females so even though you can see like 21 females watch the whole game while only 10 watched the 10 uh, the whole game 24 females watch part of the game, while only 12 watch from the group of males game, and 30 watch the none of it, and 4 like none of it. So the answer is that uh, yeah, it is fair because even though the number of females who watch the whole game or part of it it was larger than the number of men these percentages if you can sit here for males in all uh, like cat in all the categories of the uh, uh, response variable they were like higher right 0.38 and this is like larger from this, this is larger from this, this is larger from this. So again, the Simpsons paradox he said this is the direction of association between two categorical variables. Uh, when it is reversed, uh, so the slope changes uh, if we include the third variable and reanalyze the data this is known as simpson's product this is the definition the slope changed right and now we'll see another example a study in united kingdom uh, women, uh, they were asked whether they smoke, if there's like smokers or non-smokers. And this is the response variable. And 20 years later, determined uh, if they were alive or not. So data appears on the table below. 
so this asks so the x variable the question was are you a smoker if the question is yes so you are in the group of the smokers if the answer is no of the explanatory variable then you are the, in the group of no of the explanatory variables and over here for example for the group of smokers uh, we can see how many uh, after 20 years they are like dead and how many they're still alive so the total people of smokers that they were uh, they were like asked back 20 years ago they were 582 and for the non-smoker group the total number that they were asked there were 732 and 230 of them are dead now and 500 of two they're alive so the first question is that we want to compute the percentage of smoker percentage of smokers and non-smokers who died and whether it will surprise so for the percentage of uh, smokers who died uh, we so for the for the first cell so the, for this cell percent of smokers so we are in the group of smokers so x equals yes and the pers this probability will be like the the dead the smokers that they are dead divided uh, by the total smokers which is like 582 So the percentage of smokers who died, they were 23.8%. For so we first found the proportion multiplied by 100. For the second group, which is X equals no, which is their answer was no, they aren't smokers, uh, is the percentage, covers the percentage of non-smokers and we is the percent of we will calculate the percent of non-smokers who died we, we are interested in this uh, proportion and percentage so the the non-smokers in this cell who died uh, there were like 230 is the count of the dead smokers right non uh, sorry non-smokers 230 and the total is the sum of all non-smokers, which is 732. So th the the final answer, the calculate after calculation, we can say that the percent of non-smokers who died it was equal to 31.4 percent. As you can see, the like percentage of smokers who died. It was less than the percentage of non-smoker who died. So, according to this study, someone can say like smoking is good for us since less smokers died, right? Uh, compared to the non-smokers, and it wasn't what we were expecting. And we can assume why this happened, and. And potential lurking variable in this study is the age of the woman and the big at the beginning of the study. I mean, we don't have any information about their age. This information was also available and has been included in the table below. So now we included this new variable of age, which is we as we I can assume that it's a lurking variable and it will change uh, the direction. So we'll now compute the percentage of smokers and non-smokers who died for each uh, age group. And what does the data suggest about the effects of smoking? So we will do this step by step again. So ignore this ta table for now, and so this time we want to calculate 
and so the new variable that is introduced is this the ages right and we want to compute the percentage of smokers first uh, who died uh, for each group age group so first for this we keep we ignore all the age groups since we are in the, the specific age group and we also ignore the non-smokers so we focus on the smokers and this age group and to find to calculate the percentage of smokers who died at this group age group uh, we uh, like we we need the dead people of this of smoker group which was which are also in the group of this age divided by uh, both dead and alive smokers in this age group so in other words the force the total will be like in the same like it has to be in the same age group and smoker so we can find this easily because the total this time it will have the smokers and in this age group the people in this age group which were smokers all the people so which were in this age group and smokers so this is like 5 plus 174 and we divide the dead people by all people the in this when x is yes and the lurking variable age is equal to this age so this is the calculation percentage so now we are in this uh, yeah we are still in the same age group but now uh, we are in the non-smokers group so uh, we are interested if we want to calculate the percentage of smokers oh if we want to calculate the percentage of non-smokers x equals no who died died uh, for each for this age group actually for, for this age group the non-smoker percentage of who died so in order to find this we on the numerator we will have the non-smokers at this age who died which is six over the total number of both dead and alive non-smokers at this age so this and this has to be the same they both they have to be non-smokers and also they have to be in this age so six divided which are the dead people by the total dead six plus the alive so this is the desired uh, probability which is this the 2.7 is the percentage of non-smokers who died at the age group 18 to, through it up to 34 right this is the how was interpretation 2.7% we do the same for the rest and we can calculate this like this all the table and again the only reason I'm putting this transparent uh, white box is to make you like focus and make it more clear in reality after two exercises uh, you, you don't have to like hide or anything you will automatically be able to calculate so let's see so let's see for example this one this time we want to compute uh, in, so we are here we want to compute uh, 
the percentage of non-smokers who, uh, who died at this age group who died so it's 40 divided by the total number of and non-smokers at this age group so it's 40 divided by or uh, 40 plus 81 so this is the percentage uh, of people uh, of non-smokers aged 54 uh, up to 64 uh, who died is the percentage and for the final like, category of the lurking variables this age and we do the same exactly the same so our final table will look like this so each of these categories the percentage as i said it's the is a percentage of smokers or non-smokers at each uh, of the corresponding group who, who died and we can see that for each age group these are the first age group is this the second age group is this the third age group is this, the fourth age group is this. The percentage of people uh, who died is higher for smokers than non-smokers, which means all of this horizontal, this row has higher percentage than the row of non-smokers, which is true. This is smokers percent of smokers who died in each age group is higher as we, we as you can see this happened when we uh, included this third variable of age the, the lurking variable is this so now smoking seems bad for us yeah. previously it wasn't and Simpsons paradox occurred because older people were more likely to die but they were also more likely to be non-smokers so once age variable is included which was also categorical variable the association between smoking smoking equals yes and death reversed and the final question is for uh, for each age group over here for each age group uh, we want to compute the difference in the proportion of smokers and non-smokers who died and then compute the ratio of the two proportion which is called relative risk uh, which, which comparison difference or ratio best illustrates the effects of smoking on this one uh, so first we will compute the difference in proportion of smokers and non-smokers for each age uh, for each uh, age group who, who, the non smoker who died so so since the difference in the proportion of smokers and non-smokers of the people who died is the we have to take the difference of the already computed percentage of smokers and non-smokers who died on uh, each age group so different the difference is uh, 2.8 percent minus 2.7 so this is the difference so we do the same for this age group the difference 17.20 minus 9.50 
same. Uh, and then the final thing that we will compute for today is the relative risk, which is uh, which you will, you will see now. The relative risk is a ratio of the two proportions of the smokers and non-smokers who died at each age group. So we said we have to divide the division. We have to divide the smokers of each age group who died, the, per the percentage of the smokers on each age group uh, died. Uh, we have to divide that with the non-smokers of each age group uh, who died. So for the first age group over here, we'll divide the, as I said, the smokers who died, the portion, with the non-smokers who died in this age group. This is called relative risk. Right? If we divide this with this value. And the same for this age group. As you can see, uh, So the relative risk here is 1.81. What does this mean? So this means that the smokers, uh, okay, this means that the people were like a at the age of 34 up to 54. For these people, it uh, it means that smokers at this age group, they were almost twice more likely to die compared to the non-smokers, which is the denominator. So someone who was smoker and he was 35 up or between 35 and 54 years old, it has almost 1.81 times more uh, chance to die compared to someone who was non-smoker in the same and in the corresponding like age group. This is what relative risk uh, uh, means. Like the diff the and again, the, I will in okay. I will interpret the second age group, which is more interesting. So in the last age group. What is the that does the relative risk mean for this age group? So for the, what's this value? So, so it means that for this age group, 65 plus years old, uh, the smokers since we divide the smoker percentage, the smoker, the smokers there were. Uh, 1.002 uh, times more likely to die compared to the non-smokers, which is for this group is the, almost the same. And this is like the table. So we can see this is the highest. So if we, you are in this age group, 35 to 54, you really don't want to smoke uh, because you will be more uh, if you smoke, if you are a smoker, you will be 1.81 times more likely uh, to die compared to the if if uh, yeah, if you're a smoker. And this is a difference and the relative risk in the same table. So these were calculated in the previous uh, previous slides. I just add them up in, the, in one table. And now we can say that the relative risk is a better way to compare these probabilities uh, 
percent rebels of dying because it illustrates better the effects of smoking as you said in 30 in the age group of 35 to 54 years old the relative risk was 1.81 which means almost twice the chance uh, to die from smoking than non-smoking for the corresponding uh, age group right so this is a summary of the, the, this last example so in the beginning of question we p we were told that a lurking variable which was h wasn't uh, counted right and we were given this and we were asked to find this so we had this at the end of question b and in question c we were asked to find the relative risk the relative risk for each age group but, and we used uh, the calculated values uh, for non-smoker and smoker uh, probabilities for each age uh, group that there will be that and we use these values to find the right of risk right uh, someone could skip like the question b and just give the this information which was given at the beginning of question B and directly ask you uh, to calculate the relative risk right and so you should know that in order to find this first value you should uh, divide this uh, divide this by the total of 5 plus 179 and find the percentage which is 2.8 and also you have to find uh, the 6 over 6 plus 213 and find this percentage and then use them divide the 2.8 by 2.7 to find the relative risk so this step uh, the second step over here uh, can be like skipped right someone might give you this and ask you this so this was like step a uh, step two uh, something to make you understand easier so in quiz i might give you these values and ask you to find their relative risk of like dying And this is the end of lecture five. And before doing the quiz, the quiz, uh, you should uh, revise the Simpson paradox, the contingency table, the extrapolation, and this. And then you can take that quiz. Uh, thanks.